polls. He says, you know, the fact of the matter is Trump had to have some establishment Republican people because that's where the vast wealth of experience is. This isn't from Bannon. This is from another source. There was a very bad deal made. And the deal simply was the RNC said, look, we're going to promise to get you a full repeal of Obamacare by Easter. We're going to promise to get the, the tax uh, program you've outlined by August. Um, and we're going to pay off the note that you guaranteed for $75 million to your campaign. And all we want in return is we want to be able to pick two slots on the White House staff and we want veto power over the other positions. And that deal was made. And they picked their two slots. Chief of Staff, Reince Priebus, so now you know why he was there, and the head of White House personnel. Once they control those two with veto power, pretty much game over. And that's why we've ended up the way we have. Um, <clears throat> but the question here is, OK, so um, what about the deep state? Because a lot of this now is being referred to as the deep state. And I think it's fascinating that 18 months ago, probably no one in this room even knew those words or used that vocabulary. And tonight, as we unroll this, you will see that there's something really, really, really significant about just what that is. But in the meantime, what is deep state? Where does it come from and what is it? I want to start by saying that there is a difference between what I would call the permanent state or the shadow government and the deep state. Now, some of the permanent state shadow government overlaps with the deep state. But we're going to talk a little bit about historical deep state before we're done. The permanent state, however, uh, and, and it's kind of confusing because the press talks about the permanent state um, and they refer to it as deep state. That's not really right. Career bureaucrats who are embedded and they know they'll be there long after this administration has come and gone are part of the embedded state. It is very, very hard to get rid of these people. And as you probably know, Obama converted a whole bunch of appointed positions to civil service jobs just as he walked out the door so that a lot of these positions cannot be appointed as Obama had the privilege to appoint them. Um, <clears throat> and that's really the point of this deal. Then. We are going to spend just a minute on the permanent state because it's also part of the deep state, and that's the intelligence agencies in our country. There's roughly 17 intelligence agencies, and um, I will tell you that um, these guys are a, are a big problem. And if you don't know it, by the time this is done, you'll have a lot better idea that um, these guys are actually functioning as a government within a government <coughs> totally unanswerable to you, totally unanswerable to anyone. And it is maintained, really, by what are called the secrecy agreements. So we will talk just for a minute on the next slide about secrecy agreements. I don't intend this to be about permanent state, but you do need to understand that before we get too much further. The deep state, basically, is a, uh, is a collection of globalists. And these are, you know, billionaires that we've all heard about, et cetera, establishment Republicans, um, all that sort of thing. Um, these are people, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little more about what those really mean. <clears throat> it's the hard left. It's encapsulated today, really, in the Democrat Party, unfortunately. And there is a war going on in the Democrat Party, just like there's a war going on in the Republican Party. And it's Islamists. Typically, Muslim Brotherhood and ISIS are the greatest examples of it. And people say, well, how in the world, how in the world can the Islamists, the globalists, and the hard left all agree? Well, as you sit here tonight, I'm going to help you understand that. But first, I said we're going to have a quick word about secrecy agreements. Um, these are some of the <coughs> agencies that have major secrecy agreements. And let me tell you about these secrecy agreements. What they basically say is you give up all your rights to any sort of a trial. You can be imprisoned 
for revealing anything that is a classified document. And um, you, don't, you don't get out of this. You just, you just don't get out of this. But here's what's interesting about it. Notice it's not just the National Security, the National uh, Security Council and the agency, the FBI. It's in the Department of State. It's in the Department of Justice, Department of Defense, Homeland Security, the EPA, <laughs> the Internal Revenue Service, and recently the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Agency and the National Weather Service. They all have secrecy agreements now. And what this really does is this makes it almost impossible for a lot of these people to speak out about anything going on inside their agencies if it's called in any way classified. Now, it's a lot worse than that. We'll talk about it a little here. There is this 2012 Whistleblower Act. And Congress enacted it to great fanfare in order to have transparent government. Guess what? <laughs> if you have signed a secrecy agreement, you are not under the Whistleblower Act. So you got a problem. Now, later on, they amended it. And you can be a whistleblower under the Secrecy uh, Act if you are still serving in the spot at the time that you decide to talk about it. But the problem with that is that you then also have to agree that it's going to be an entirely internal process. And they put you under great strain and great stress and then they recommend that there are counselors there, you know, while you go through the process and work this out, you can go talk to. You go to the counselor and they immediately begin to put things in your file. And now your career is over. So it's, and it gets a lot uglier and more brutal than that, but we're not here to talk about that. The last thing I would note is Operation Mockingbird. I don't know if you all are aware of Operation Mockingbird, but it was a, it was a program that was designed to allow the CIA in specific to um, get their version of the world in the Washington Post, in the New York Times, et cetera, et cetera. Anytime you hear there's an anonymous intelligence source, this is the CIA. And most of the time, most of the time, it's, uh, it's a fairly planted story. Um, Operation Mockingbird was an actual program to take uh, reporters uh, from newspapers and cultivate them and basically say, look, you're going to get a scoop, but if you don't print just exactly what we tell you, we're going to take it to your competitor. And no reporter has been able to walk away from that. And it is still in operation today. If not codified, it is still in operation today in, in practice. So you need to know a little bit about kind of what the game board looks like. Okay, globalists. Who are the globalists? Well, first off, they're the elites. They sort of believe in this thing that they call social Darwinism. And what that really means is they've been rich enough or powerful enough, long enough, that they are now elite and they're just a little more capable of managing our lives than we are. They believe, basically, that a collectivist form of government is the best model. They believe that that's what's really good for you. Uh, and they believe that the state is the highest authority, that the rights are decreed by the state, they're not granted by God, and um, some of them, in fact a fair number of them, will even profess to be Christians, and yet that's what they think. And you say, well, how can that be? I like to illustrate it this way. There's a whole lot of Christians out there that think heaven is full of good people. I hate to burst your bubble, but it ain't true. Heaven in the Christian religion, the New Testament, is full of people who have come to realize they are not good and their only hope of salvation is Jesus Christ. If you believe that heaven is full of good people, the underlying tone of that is that you can somehow earn it yourself. And that is absolutely not according to the New Testament. So they may think they're Christians, 
And if they think heaven's full of good people and they can kind of earn it themselves, guess what else what happens if they're very rich or very powerful? They want to do these good things. They want to do these good things with your money and your lives. So it's a problem. Um, they believe in a one world solution. You hear about the one world government guys, this is kind of them. And they are real and they do believe that and they do believe that this is the best thing for the world. They believe, they don't necessarily believe in the moral superiority of Western civilization. They believe it should be a one world government. That there is nothing exceptional about the Western world other than arrogance. Um, they believe that the ends justify the means. And I guess ground zero for this school of thought is really the Fletcher School of Diplomacy at Tufts University. Now it's spread all over the place, but that's really kind of where ground zero starts out. Uh, many are stun stunningly wealthy. You, you know, George Soros is exhibit A. Uh, Zuckerberg, KKR, uh, a lot of the Republican establishment, all of them are globalists. And essentially, this is the important point. Essentially, they sort of believe that man can only be saved by man. Man can only be saved by man. So that's, that's the globalists. Let's talk about the hard left. Now, the hard left is a little different crew. Um, they don't have as big a bank account in some cases. But they're generally communists or fascists or socialists or anarchists or progressives or totalitarians or statists. And today, all those people just basically pervade the Democrat Party. They believe that the state is the highest authority, hence rights are given to you and decreed to you by the state because that's God, not something that you've been given um, as an unalienable right. They don't believe that people can necessarily rule themselves. Whoops, where'd that go? Um, Yeah, they don't believe people can rule themselves, and they don't think that freedom and liberty make for a sustainable or even a desirable society. Uh, they, they like to see society as classes, because once you have classes, then you can create grievances between classes. They don't see all of you all as individuals. They see race, color, creed, national origin, because those are all classes that can be set upon and set apart from each other through grievances. Uh, they believe that a perfect utopian outcome can be fostered by wise elites who force equality of circumstances. Um, they think that that'll eliminate envy. It's all really about materialism, and so that's a good thing. Uh, in essence, they profess to believe that man can be made perfect only by man. Sound familiar? Didn't we just talk about the globalists believe that same thing? Yeah, we did. So they actually agree with the globalists on that one. Now, we're going to talk quite a bit about the Islamists for a minute because we, we've talked a little bit about uh, Islam here, I know, from time to time. But um, there's, there's some things about Islam that you might not know that's important for you to know for this discussion. The first one is, it's not really just a religion, it's an ideology, and it's a totalitarian ideology, and it takes its uh, authority from an unknowable remote God. I don't know if you realize that uh, a true Islamist believes he prays to God, but God doesn't hear him. God doesn't have any personal relationship with him. It's rules and regulations. And as a result of that, the rules and the regulations have to be enforced by men who, um, as you'll learn here pretty quickly, are really sort of self-appointed executioners in a lot of cases. Um, Christians believe that Satan is the great deceiver. Islamists believe that Allah is the great deceiver. And they think that because Allah is so shrewd. And so lying to infidels and deceiving infidels and anything or everything you say is perfectly good because it's actually an act of piety. You are imitating Allah. You got to start thinking like Islamists if you want to understand what's going on here and why they're the third leg of this triangle. 
uh, Islam is progressive in its history and nature. Uh, that is, throughout history, they say, well, in the beginning, there was the Jewish law. And as long as there was just the Jewish law, the people that practiced it were absolutely right and good. And then Christ comes along and he changes the rules. And at that point, practicing the old Jewish law was not right and good. You had to follow what Christ said. And then in the late 500s, of course, Muhammad shows up and Muhammad overrules Christ and the old Jewish law. It's, it's a progressive, whatever was the last word out of the box is the last word and supreme. Um, the Quran, likewise, is the same way. It's revealed in stages. This is very important. Later pronouncements abrogate earlier ones. The Quran is not arranged in chronological order. There are 114 surahs or chapters in the Quran. Surah 9 is the next to last one. Interestingly enough, Surah 9 is all about jihad. Um, it's also interesting that in the earlier surahs, the Mecca revelations make no reference to Sharia or to jihad. None. It is that religion that they would have you believe it is today, a religion more or less of peace. But when you get into the Medina revelations, which came along about 13 years later, now you're about jihad, you're about Sharia, and you're about some very rigid rules and laws for what you must do. Because in Islam, you have to earn it. You have to earn it. And because it's a remote God, you never really know where you are, except in a couple of situations and in those situations, they say that you have rights. For instance, if you are committing jihad and die, under most situations, you have the right to heaven. So you don't have to worry about it. You're killing infidels, you don't have to worry about it. It's an important thing uh, and, and concept to understand that they, they believe that. Um, okay, a little more about it. It's not a religion of peace, as we said. Uh, it, uh, it makes really clear if you read the Quran, and I had to read the Quran at Duke. I mean, I had two political science majors, if you would. One was the Middle East in the 1900s, the rise and evolution of it, and Germany from 1925 to 45. Tonight you'll see they're both very, uh, uh, that was probably very uh, interesting and maybe not entirely coincidental, although at the time I thought it was just because it was interesting and I could stay awake in those classes and some of the others I couldn't. Uh, anyway, um, whoop, we must have accidentally switched that back. So here we go. Not a religion of peace. Um, you, have to, uh, you have to do jihad. It's a requirement to do jihad. You cannot quit doing jihad until all the infidels are subjugated or dead. Okay? Uh, killing and enslaving non-Muslims and those Muslims who don't adhere to Sharia is an act of piety. I mean, that's how they look at it. You, you read some of these surahs. Kill the unbelievers wherever you find them. That's in the Quran Surah 2191. Make war on the infidels living in your neighborhood. That's Quran 9, Surah 9. 123, when opportunity arises, kill the infidels wherever you catch them. That's another Surah 9.5. Maim and crucify the infidels if they criticize Islam. That's uh, Surah 5.33. Punish the unbelievers with garments of fire, hooked iron rods, boiling water, melt their skin and bellies. That's Quran 22.19. That's a pleasant one, isn't it? Terrorize and behead those who believe in scriptures other than the Quran. And that's in Surah 8.12. And I go on and on and on. Here's the interesting thing, though. All jihad is defensive by their definition. So when they go and attack a city, they are simply being defensive. They are never offensive in their minds. That's, that's one of the important pieces that you have to realize. Um, and then this is the last thing, and, and we'll move along. This is important, though. Terrorism, in their minds, isn't what you and I think of. 
terrorism in their mind is killing a Muslim who didn't have rights. Oh, excuse, uh, excuse me. Yes. It, it's the killing a Muslim without the right to be killing that Muslim under Sharia law. That's what terrorism is. So if Donald Trump goes to the Middle East and gets with the king of Saudi Arabia and they both agree that they're against terrorism, they are talking about two totally different topics. And you just have to know that. Uh, it's unlawful to conduct funeral prayers for someone who dies doing any form of jihad because jihad is sacred. And the martyr has rights to heaven if he dies under the right form of jihad. And that's why in the London, uh, you remember when the, uh, the guy ran into all those people on the London Bridge and killed them? And you may have seen the headlines in the London papers that 131 imams refused to say funeral prayers for this guy. And everybody says, wow, they're condemning him. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. They were honoring him. He died doing jihad. So he automatically had rights. Had they said funeral prayers in the Islamic world, had they said funeral prayers, they would have been suggesting to Allah that he didn't do proper jihad. You see how that difference really matters? So you got to understand where these guys are coming from. A um, couple other things. The term human rights actually originates in Islamic jihad. And it means the imposition of Islam. That's what human rights means when they talk about that term. Um, slander is saying anything about a Muslim that the Muslim dislikes. Extremism is going too far too fast. You talked to some of our troops, and it was interesting. When they were uh, in Iraq, they discovered that they could go into villages, and the villagers would be killing some of the jihadists. And when they would ask them why, were they glad to be liberated, the answer was not. It had nothing to do with liberation. The answer was the jihadists had gone too far too fast. And that's what had provoked the Americans to come in. If they had just gone a little slower or a little more subtle or some other way, and they hadn't gotten so far as to provoke the Americans to come in, they would still be celebrated. It's a different world in their world. So, essentially, Islamists believe that mankind can be saved from man, by mankind, forcibly subjugating, enslaving, or killing all who don't strictly adhere to the rules that are laid out by Muhammad in the Quran. And they actually feel that if you will not subjugate yourself in the way that you're supposed to in Sharia law, um, that the best thing for you, personally, is to die. So they, they don't think there's a problem there. You will notice that all of those believe mankind can be saved by man. It is this model that we've talked about. I don't know, some of you have seen the series I did called Connecting the Dots. And if you did, you remember that I told you this is sort of the org chart for all the countries of all the world, more or less, throughout history. A lot of them had a god up in top, whether it was the Greeks or the Romans or someone else. Um, you then had government, which can be any of these, uh, globalists, progressives. Now, these guys have evolved to the point where they no longer need God. It's all about the state is God. But you still have the Islamists down here who still have a supposed God running their deal. But, you know, in, in old times, it was the Catholic Church in the five and six and seven hundreds that had that model. It was kings who had that model, monarchies, all they, always that model. So what happened, and we talked about this, what happened was this guy, Jesus Christ, the most polarizing political figure in the history of the world, shows up. And he really screws up the deal. Because what he says is, you know what? You matter. You can have a relationship with God, personal. You pray to him, he will hear you. He will acknowledge you. He knows every hair on your head. And when that happens, you have a moral code that goes along with it. And when you have a moral code, and these people all generally 
try their best however much they fail. You will find that those citizens begin to try at least to do the right thing. You can then enact laws based on them, the Ten Commandments, the old Judeo-Christian uh, heritage we talk about, maybe the Eleventh Commandment, which is, you know, do unto others as they do unto you. It's sort of a universal moral code, and when you do that and people self-police themselves, more or less, then you unleash freedom. Because you can allow people to be free because they're more or less policing themselves. So those are really the two models that we're talking about. And just remember, the globalists, the progressives, the Islamists, they're not buying into that. So, the deep state. A couple of quotes by Alexis de Tocqueville. I don't know if you all have ever taken the time to, uh, to read Democracy in America, but if you haven't, you should. Uh, it's, it's an unbelievable book. We had to read it for political science, and, uh, and I really enjoyed it. Okay. Uh, you can see his quotes here about it. We want to step into how did the steep, deep state get together. Well, the modern hard left, of course, traces its roots back to Karl Marx, 1849, and Hegel. And the only difference, really, in a lot of ways between Marx and Hegel was that Hegel was all about the dialectic of the spirit, and Marx was all about materialism. And that's why uh, getting rid of all individuality, all everything, and putting everybody down with the same outcome was so important to, uh, to Marx. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood was really started in 1928 by a guy named uh, Hassan Ahmed Abdel Rahman Muhammad al -Bana. I know, phew, boy, whatever happened to Bill? Anyway, um, he is known as Sheikh Rahman, and I want you to remember that name because it's going to become very interesting and important here in just a minute. The globalists have been around a long time, uh, but their rise and organized cooperation has sort of taken flight since the 1900s, uh, due in no small part to what happened in World War I and World War II, uh, the UN that came out of it, and advances in technology. But tonight what I want you to realize is that mostly it was Nazi Germany in history that brought all these guys together. Think of it this way. Nazi Germany built the clubhouse for which all these guys got to be members, got to know each other, have burgers at lunch, play nine holes of golf, etc. Well, tell me about that. Okay, Nazi Germany. Of course, we had the Weimar Republic that starts in 1919, and then we really have the Nazi Party taken over in 1933 uh, till 45 when things went really south for the boys. Uh, it starts with the globalists, and the globalists um, really kind of got into the act. Prescott Bush, who um, is the grandfather of George H.W., excuse me, George W. Bush, and the father of our first Bush, Herbert Walker, uh, his father-in-law was Herbert Walker. And Herbert Walker was friends with Averill Harriman. Uh, that was Brown Brothers Harriman. He was the Harriman of E.H. Harriman of the Union Pacific Railroad. And um, they had Brown Brothers Harriman. Harriman and um, they had a client at Brown Brothers who was this German industrialist, Fritz, Fritz Tusen. And they were probably the most powerful, richest industrialists in Germany, and they had survived World War I and II, and had sort of realized that maybe they needed to start getting their money out in a lot of other places, because Germany wasn't doing too well in the Weimar Republic. And so the Tucson started forming all these shell companies all over the world, and the one that they got going in the U.S. was the Union Bank uh, Corporation. And um, Prescott Bush was the first managing director, appointed by his father-in-law, Herbert Walker, and Averill Harriman. And so uh, it, it is said, and there's no real hard evidence that I know of either way, 
Maybe they were nominee shares, or maybe they were actual ownership shares, but he was the director. And through Union Bank, they brought in all kinds of investors and money, and it was one of the, this was probably one of the most important conduits in rebuilding the Third Reich. Kennedys came in and gave money. All kinds of folks came in because of Brown Brothers and put money, and they shipped tons of gold, they shipped war bonds, they shipped steel, they shipped everything that Germany needed to rebuild itself. Interestingly enough, Bush got to be friends with a whole lot of other Nazi characters at the time. He got on the several boards, including this Silesian Steel Company. Now, this is not a bash on the Bushes. This is simply the fact that these are how the globalists got in to Germany and why they did. It was investing. It was building relationships. It was building a country. Interestingly enough, Fritz Tusen, by 1941, had suddenly decided they'd <coughs> built a monster and he fled to Paris, but that's going to come up here in a minute. So, stage one, we have UBC, the Bushes, and the globalists, who are now all involved with Nazi Germany. Act two, Sheikh Rahman. Now, this is a guy in 1928 who formed the Muslim Brotherhood. He, uh, he had some help from the Brits. Remember, the Brits at this point were still in an imperial power, and they thought like imperialists. And that means you always got to have guys to set against each other in the local areas so that you can keep them busy while you go and manipulate behind the scenes what you need. Um, Rahman was a big fan of Hitler, wrote to him constantly. And finally, at some point, Hitler goes, you know what, I'm going to send you some money. So Hitler starts supporting them as well. And as a result, from 1928 till about 1938, the Muslim Brotherhood grows from 200 members to 200,000 members. Now, in the meantime, Germany is going to war, and this guy, Reinhard Galen, who was the head of intelligence for the Eastern Front for the Nazis, Reinhardt finds himself in charge of all of these Muslim Brother intel units. And he's got this whole network of guys all through the Middle East, and it's really important because you know what? Germany had coal. You ever tried to run an army tank or fly a Stuka on coal? Doesn't work well. They had to have oil. And that oil was the Baku oil fields, it was in Iraq, it was all throughout the Middle East. So the Muslim Brotherhood becomes really important in this whole little deal going on here. So now we got the Muslim Brothers and we got UBC. The Anafascists came in, Antifa. Name you recognize? Antifa starts back here. It was those who claimed to be anti-fascists. They were very, very useful to the Nazis because the Nazis, in order to take over, needed to create mayhem and violence in the street. And they had the brown shirts, but they had to have somebody to beat up on or to beat up on them. And so they actually encouraged some of the socialists and the communists and stirred up issues there so that they could have really important street fights. And eventually, Germany got so tired of all of this that they just wanted order. And when people are overcome with just collapse of society like this, they often turn to strong leaders, and in this case, it was Adolf Hitler. So that's how the hard left got involved. And that brings us to our good buddy, George Soros. Now, he was Jewish by birth, but interestingly enough, he was able to work with the Muslim Brotherhood and the Waffen-SS in Bucharest. Uh, and he helped them round up Jews in hiding. And he helped them get them to concentration camps, confiscate their wealth, which was a pretty <coughs> lucrative endeavor. And he has said in his own books that those were the very best days of his life. That's the guy. So there we go. They all are in the clubhouse. Well, what happens? Well, it doesn't work out so well. Nazi Germany goes away. But the relationships stay. 
and deep state is formed. So how does this, uh, how does this develop? Well, I'm not going to spend all night long telling you about all the details, but let me tell you a few important ones so you'll know them. Union Bank uh, Corporation was actually seized by the United States government um, once Pearl Harbor hit under Trading with the Enemy Act. Whole bunch of U.S. companies were seized because of that. Because a lot of other companies had spawned out of this. But here's the interesting thing. Out of all the companies that were seized, Union Bank Corporation was not liquidated. All the rest were liquidated. So when the war was over, the owners of Union Bank Corporation got the stock back. And they had a lot of assets. It is said, although it cannot be proven, there don't seem to be any definitive records, but it is said that Prescott Bush got between a million and a million and a half bucks in 1946 for his share. I don't know if that's true. I'm not representing it. That's what's out there. Um, Reinhard Galen was made head of Germany's intelligence agency. The head of Nazi intelligence for the Middle East becomes the head of West Germany's intelligence agency. And because we had gotten rid of the OSS and we wanted to build this new organization that was going to be called the Central Intelligence Agency and we needed networks, we turned to Reinhard Galen because they had all the networks and they didn't let them go away. And so Reinhard Galen, the head of Nazi intelligence for the Middle East, brings the Muslim Brotherhood directly in to the CIA's new fledgling offices in Europe. How about that? Um, they also brought in some other people, by the way. Adolf Eichmann worked for the American CIA for a while. It took Israel to go and get Eichmann. And they did it in spite of the American CIA. Good for them. Uh, anyway, both the Nazis and the Muslim Brotherhood rose in the ranks of the CIA and eventually got into some of our nuclear missile programs and into the DOD <laughs> itself. In fact, Eisenhower, late in his deal, was so disturbed when he learned of what was called Operation Paperclip, which is what the CIA named this operation of bringing in all these Nazis and, and Muslim Brotherhood guys, that he did a very famous speech, and I've got it in the reference here. You can go and, and look at it yourself if you want to clip on the reference page. Um, and he talks about the military-industrial complex. Actually, it was originally the congressional military industrial complex. They just dropped the congressional part because he was worried about sensitivities. But <clears throat> the point is that um, back then Eisenhower started to be concerned about it. Eisenhower passed along those concerns to the next president, interestingly enough, a guy named John F. Kennedy. And John F. Kennedy in 1961 said that after looking at it, he was extremely concerned about this organization called the Central Intelligence Agency. And he felt like it really needed to be um, broken up and put into various pieces. That is the last president before Donald Trump to actually challenge the CIA. Okay? Anyway, during this time, it's about 1962, um, a new Enterprising young officer is recruited into the CIA. <coughs> he uh, happens to be Prescott Bush's son. His name is George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, he later serves as the ambassador to China. Then he became the director of the CIA in 76-77. By all accounts, did a terrific job at rebuilding morale. And uh, this was just after the church uh, hearings. And he ultimately became our 41st president after serving as Ronald Reagan's VP for years. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood, for their part, would continue to work with the CIA as they were, in fact, embedded in parts of it. 
they played a very active role with us in, uh, in the whole uh, Abdul Nasser problem and the Sadat problem and things like that. And it was interesting that um, each time our guys kept thinking how, wow, working with these folks will really, really help and benefit us both. But ultimately, it always seems to have only benefited the Muslim Brotherhood. So it wasn't too surprising that the Arab Spring and the overthrow of Mubarak was brought to you by the Muslim Brotherhood, George Soros, and the CIA, all working together, some of whom were, of course, always globalists. And um, that's going to become very important here in just a moment. So it's also maybe worth knowing that a lot of people in the CIA were real fans of this whole org deal. Uh, deal. Uh, a guy named John Brennan was the station chief in Riyadh at the time. And he ended up convincing the CIA to issue some very special visas to guys coming out of Afghanistan. And as a result of that, 15 of the 17 hijackers that flew in to the Twin Towers were here on CIA-issued visas. Historical fact. Okay. So you say, wow, these guys have been buddies for a long time. They're all working together. Uh, you know, is everything a deep state deal? No. No, not everything is. And, and we're not conspiratorialists. Well, maybe some of us are, but I'm not uh, conspiratorialists here. But I do want to give you a couple of examples here of what might be and might not be uh, a deep state operation. Benghazi was most certainly a deep state operation. The uh, Raman Brigade, which I call RB, they now, we now know they were responsible for the attack on the embassy. And they were formed to force the return of the blind sheikh. Now notice the blind sheikh's last name. That is because he is the dynastic successor to the original sheikh Rahman. And so when we captured him because of his role in the World Trade Center bombing in 93 and imprisoned him for life, plus 15 years, I don't know what we're going to do with the corpse for 15, but the point is, it had become a huge, huge deal to the Muslim Brotherhood to get back their dynastic leader. It's like our president being kidnapped, and we would want him back unless, of course, it was Obama. But um, the bottom line is, at least we probably should want them back, right? So RB was sent to Benghazi by the Egyptian President Morsi. And remember, Morsi was the guy after Mubarak who came in and was a hardcore Muslim brother and became the head of Egypt. And it was bad news from day one. But in order to get elected, in order to get elected, Morsi had made a promise. And the promise was to all of the electorate, the promise was that he would get, with the help of Hillary Clinton's State Department, he would get the blind shake back. He gets elected. He approaches the state of New York where the blind shake was in prison, and the state of New York says, <laughs> not on your life, buddy, forget it. So they go to work at the State Department, and they think, well, we can't actually order New York to release this guy. So we got to come up with a way that we just have no choice but to release this guy. And so the plot is hatched. Hillary at this point, by the way, is running guns all through Libya and on up into Syria because we're actually creating ISIS for a different reason. We're, we're actually helping to create all those guys. And Benghazi is a gun transshipment point. So the idea here is that we're going to allow Chris Stevens, our ambassador, to be um, abducted, and then he'll be a pawn that they will come to the United States and say, we'll give you your ambassador back in exchange for the blind shake. And of course, it was a setup all along because Hillary helped set it up. How do we know that? Well, we know that a number of ways. First, Chris Stevens visited a guy at the DOD before he left. Very unusual for an ambassador.
to come and ask for a CIA, I mean a DOD briefing. Usually he gets a CIA, he gets a state, he may get an NSC, but he goes to the DOD. And when he does, an interesting thing happens. The DOD somehow becomes interested and the officer in charge writes out the drone request form to conduct surveillance over Benghazi while he is there because he is concerned. Otherwise, there would have been no drones on station that night watching everything that went down. That was not part of the plan. More interesting things happen. The State Department removes Stevens' security detail just a day or so before they send him in. They tell him, you don't leave, et cetera, et cetera. And it probably all would have gone pretty well, and Chris Stevens probably would have been abducted, and he probably would have been uh, pretty brutally treated, but would have been traded back alive, except one thing. There were some Navy SEALs who didn't get the memo. It is true that, um, it is true that uh, there were a number of units that were ready to go in and that were told to stand down. Okay, uh, let's see what else here. Um, we know that there was no protest, as was claimed. We claimed that it was a protest that got out of control and all of that. There was no protest. We now know that. The video only had had five viewings on YouTube at the time that supposedly this attack took place. It was ridiculous. But it was cooked up, and by the way, members of both the Democrat Party leadership and the Republican Party leadership were well aware of this cover-up and what was going on. Um, that's, probably, that's probably all we really need to say about that. Now this is one that's not an example, and I want you to kind of see the difference here. That one just smelled bad from the beginning. Everybody from the beginning knew there was something wrong. And then when you had this great cover-up story that was just ludicrous, it was so ludicrous, it was insulting, and we knew something else was going on, we just didn't know what. That's a hallmark of a deep state kind of operation. They're not really always all that good. Uh, the sailor capture in Iran, you remember when the sailors were captured in the torpedo boat? That actually wasn't a deep state operation, it had nothing to do with it. What happened was, Russia has been experimenting with what's called geospoofing in the Black Sea. And what that means is that you can, they, they intercept the GPS signal and they reconfigure it and they then send it down to whoever is trying to pull the signal. If it's a boat in the Black Sea, there are always boats that want it, that's how they navigate. And they tell them they're somewhere else. And freighters began to discover that when they docked uh, there, uh, they were at the airport. Lots of freighters began to discover. I mean, the airport was covered up with freighters. Well, the Russians were, were experimenting with geo-spoofing. And the next thing we know, uh, these sailors are going along, and the fact of the matter is, their GPS said they were right where they were supposed to be. The problem was they were deep inside Iranian waters. The Iranians were dealing with geo-spoofing. Why? Well, the reason they were is because they want to be able to close down the Straits of Hormuz. They want to kill all the tanker traffic in the and create uh, an emergency in a time of war. And the easiest way to do that, rather than build a bunch of installations that the United States is just going to come knock out, the easiest way to do that is just to geo-spoof a bunch of freighters and have them all run into each other or onto the rocks and just basically bottle up the straits. So that's, that's what that was about. Um, so that wasn't a deep state deal at all, and it was really pretty straightforward. Now, Trump is clearly under assault right now by the deep state. Uh, the intelligence agencies have launched some of their best efforts against him. Susan Rice, we now know, um, was unmasking people. They were surveilling Trump. Uh, they were doing it early on um, in order to make sure he didn't win the primary. When he won the primary, they, they really scratched their heads because they had sort of hinted he had some Russian stuff going on, but nothing really serious. Then um, what happened was we've seen um, uh, some other things going on. This unmasking <laughs> that we now have learned uh, went on massively, not just one or two or three. We've learned it went on massively. Um, 
the goal was not just to unseat Trump, bad as that would be, their goal is actually to foment a false narrative of racism. Can you remember Lee Park? Foment racism and divide by classes to create social unrest and violence so that a new government can be brought in to restore order. It's the old divide and conquer, the same old as Antifa and the brown shirts. We are actually seeing this unfold now in real time. And this is important why you understand who Deep State is and what this is about. And the whole Confederate statue issue is part of a larger Deep State operation. Say negative things about a country's founders so people emotionally detach from them. Once you get them into a neutral position, they're detached from their, their history, then they don't remember where they came from and they can be easily brainwashed into a communist future or whatever else. That happens to be Marx and Alinsky, by the way, so that's why it says communist future. Um, let me go back. Oop, there we go. I think we've, we've talked about most of that. All right. And along with this, of course, is the attacks on free speech on campus. Um, they want to encourage anger. They want to have classes that feel aggrieved by other classes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And <clears throat> I will tell you right now, if you had access to the dark web and the deep web, you will hear these people talking about the fact that in 18 months, the goal is to get enough detachment that they can begin to talk about, we just need to change the flag. That's their ultimate target, right there. And it's being talked about. So, irony and clues that it's a setup. Well, the irony of this Confederate issue, I gotta tell you, is hilarious. Uh, you know, if it weren't so serious, I would just be rolling. But the Democrats were the party of the Old South. The Democrats were the party of the Ku Klux Klan. The Democrats were, were the, uh, uh, party of Jim Crow laws. So the obvious answer is, why isn't anybody saying we need to get rid of the Democrats? Really? Even more than that, at the time, Muslim slave traders were the very guys who were supplying all of the slaves to the United States. Virtually every slave in the United States was purchased through Muslim slave traders. No one's talking about censuring them. This is a 1950 quote. A guy named James Warburg, Warburg Pincus. You probably may remember some of those guys. He was on the Council of Foreign Relations and he was giving testimony before the Senate Subcommittee on uh, Foreign Relations in 1950. This is quote, we shall have world government whether, we now, whether or not we like it. The question is only whether world government will be achieved by consent or by conquest. That is the globalist mentality. For their part, the hard left says, we're socialists, we're the enemies of today's capitalist system of exploitation. We're determined to destroy the system under all conditions. Now, here's the fun part. Was that Elizabeth Warren? Adolf Hitler or Bernie Sanders? <laughs> Sorry, Adolf Hitler in the speech in 1927. But this is a fun game. Let's play it some more. <laughs> Coexistence on this tightly knit earth should be viewed as an existence not only without wars, but also without the government telling us how to live, what to say, what to think, what to know, and what not to know. Who said that? Your choices, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Ronald Reagan, or Thomas Jefferson? Sorry, it was Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And that was a guy who knew, because he'd been there. All right, what are we up against? Well, this happens to be a small map of George Soros's network. This is open society. Here's old George. Here's the Obama campaign. 
I mean, you just go through here and all of these guys are in the Soros network. We are not up against a beginner. This is a very pervasive deal that we're going to have to be dealing with. While many congressmen and judges are compromised by blackmail material that's been gathered by the intelligence agencies for the last 30 years, and let me tell you, we've seen a lot of it, and it is real, and it is out there, and a lot of judges and congressmen are subject to blackmail by our own intelligence agencies, and they are. Um, Trump is not a part of that. That's why Deep State doesn't like him. And he also says bad things about him. First guy since JFK. <coughs> Trump might not want to travel in any convertibles anytime soon. There is a lot, but here's the good news. There is now a large and growing awareness of the deep state and the crisis it presents due largely to deep state missteps. For instance, the CIA has been running this false flag operation of Trump-Russian collusion. But Every day, because they've been running this, people are investigating it. And every day, more and more stuff is coming to light, and more and more Americans are going, this is garbage. And instead, they're talking about the deep state. This is not what deep state wants to have happen. Uh, increasingly, the contents of Hillary Clinton's emails are coming to light and making clear what's really going on. Comey, Clapper, and Brennan all believed that Trump was going to lose. They just absolutely knew it. And so what was really going on was that they were worried that Hillary would be elected email and they needed to whitewash and sanitize this incredible string of felonies that she had created by having this server and all this classified material on it. If you want to know why Comey, who is really just supposed to be a policeman, suddenly decides he is the district attorney and the grand jury, it's because they had to whitewash it before the election. So they were talking about Russian meddling, but then Trump gets elected and the whole narrative changes. Now it's Trump colluding with the Russians. They had to invent a whole new narrative. And of course, the more that that narrative has been circulated, as silly as it's now becoming, the more other stuff is beginning to come out. So the American people aren't having any of it. I think that's part of the reason why you just saw Judge Roy Moore win in Alabama. And interestingly enough, if you go into polling, you will find out that the Trump supporters, even though Trump said he supported Strange, the Trump supporters go, no, he didn't. He just did that for them. We know what's going on here. They're wising up. Um, as I said, 18 months ago, you hadn't even heard the words deep state. And now everybody here is talking about it. This is the worst possible news for the deep state. Um, recognize that there's one thing the deep state really fears, and that's Christianity. That is the key. And when we talk here in just the next slide or two, what you can do, you're going to see that. Don't give up. Yeah, well, you saw George Soros Network, but you know what? There's a lot of guys out there now who are also working against George Soros, more than you can possibly imagine, and a lot of them have come out of the intelligence agencies. You probably are unaware of the fact that there were 300 very top-level intelligence agents who all resigned en masse at the end of 2015 and early 16. The reason you're not aware of it is that Trump, is that Obama, went and classified all of their resignation letters so they, under the Secrecies Act, couldn't talk about it. It's that Secrecy Act deal. Um, so don't give up. There's a lot going on. I think we're actually winning. And we're winning because these guys are having to reveal themselves and be revealed. And the more they keep this thing going, the worse it's going to get for them. So the pot is building more pressure every day. Let me give you a little example of that. Uh, Anthony Weiner, you know, they found his computer. They had 600 pedophile names on Anthony Weiner's computer. And um, not too long ago, 
they had an arrest of about 400 pedophiles in California and 200 up in Michigan and some out on the East Coast. Is this about sweeping up pedophiles? No, 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 not at all. This is about a very plotting long-term investigation because they don't care so much about the pedophiles. They want to know the sponsors, the movers, the shakers, the providers. It's just like busting a drug cartel. You start by arresting the dealers. And you tell them what the prison term is, and by the way, these will be your roommates, and suddenly they really kind of want to talk to you about who they bought the stuff from. So that's what this is going on, because the New York Police Department is not happy that they didn't get to release and go after a whole bunch of the stuff on Anthony Weiner's computer right away. The Fed shut it down. And so now these arrests are taking place. So the, the pressure is building, and it's built, this is just one example. There's, I could give you 20 more. So here's the recommendations, guys. Stir and keep stirring the pot regarding deep state on social media, to your friends, to your church. Your pastors don't get it by and large. Oh yeah, there's some in town that do. Gateway and Watermark and First Baptist. Absolutely. There's a whole lot of them that don't. Um, fire your congressman or senator if he's not a real constitutionalist. You know, part of the problem, the rise of deep state has been enabled by the lack of courage in our Congress. When Comey lied to them and committed a felony by his own admission because he had given classified information to another guy, they should have immediately hauled this guy off. When, when they tell you, we want you to provide this information, and the FBI says, we don't think so, or the IRS says, hmm, not today, Congress has the right to have the bailiff come in and imprison that guy right there, then and there, until he decides to talk. Congress needs to do that. Right now, it's just like you're having a, a hearing for a, a, a killer downtown, and when it's all said and done and they say, okay, you're guilty, but they're never going to have a trial, they're never going to have a sentencing. There's no consequences. That's what's happening. So it's a congressional problem because they're not willing to be constitutionalists. We have to demand a vast scale back on secrecy. And I may come back and really bore you one night with a talk just about the Secrecy Act because it is really important and you need to understand that. But we need to really scale it back. We need to demand that the surveillance state is scaled back and that whistleblowers can truly be protected. What has happened since 2001 is that we used to have all this ability to go out and surveil phone and internet traffic. And it was really, really, really hard to surveil US citizens. Under Obama, that's all changed. And in fact, all that vacuum cleaner that used to be focused out is now focused in. And I will tell you, in Utah, your emails and your telephone calls are on tape. Sorry, it's true. The capabilities of these people now are stunning. More than stunning. And they're still doing it. Um, I think we need to demand that uh, of our congressmen or our senators that uh, Mueller either be retired. In fact, I think he needs to be relieved anyway. He's got such a huge conflict of interest. He's all part of the design of the whole Russiagate deal. And it needs to, then the conclusion, it needs to be brought to a conclusion or at least return to the original focus. This should not be a fishing trip on Donald Trump and anybody he's ever gotten close to. Um, we need to demand that Jeff Sessions and the Congress prosecute Comey. Pure and simple. I mean, the guy admitted it. I killed him. Well, okay, I'm good. We need to demand that Sessions and the Congress go back to emails of, of Hillary's email scandal with her secret server, her top secret, and aggressively pursue it. How do we do that? Well, here's the key. The FBI just replied to Judicial Watch. You know, Judicial Watch put in a FOIA request 
for all of the investigation materials. And you know what the FBI told them? There's no interest. And so we don't have to, there's no public interest, nobody's interested in it, so we don't need to comply with that. We need to let them know that's a false statement. That's exactly what we need. So there's a lot we can do here, guys, and believe me, as Thomas Jefferson said, when people fear their government, there's tyranny. But when the government fears the people, then there is freedom and liberty. And that's what this is really all about. Here are all things that you can look at. This will be at, at the end. These, these are live. This was Eisenhower's speech I referenced. This is uh, the National Security Archive. This will tell you all about uh, Reinhard Galen. Um, this happens to be, um, th this is uh, Rich Higgins' seven page memo. So you can go out and read it. It's terrific. And then these are a couple by a retired CIA officer, a guy named Kevin Shipp. Sometimes Kevin's a little out there, but he's got a lot of good stuff to say too. And he'll tell you a lot about the deep state. So, there we go, and thank you very much. Q&A? It's 8.30, I think we better shut it down.